Welcome back to episode 10 of She Got Next. Time is flying by. Thank you guys for continuing to watch and support. Dallas, you got a new setup behind you. What's going on over there? I'm actually in Lexington, Kentucky, about to go to the SEC game, Alabama versus Kentucky, 17 <laughs> versus 13. It's probably going to be the game of the day, uh, probably one of the best games of the year. Two high-scoring teams, Rob Dillingham versus Sears at Alabama. Great guard play, uh, crazy environment. Coming off the buzzer beater loss, Alabama's coming off the comeback win against Florida. Uh, I'm very excited. Uh, this is going to be a crazy, crazy, crazy game at Rupp Arena. And I've never been to an actual college like where it's actually the full team. I've always been to the games when they're a tournament game, Final Four, Elite Eight. So the this is going to be like my, game. my first crazy regular season game. I've been to DePaul, you know, but okay. not, yeah, like, but not <laughs> two ranked teams mm -hmm. midday. Prime time basketball. It's going to be amazing. Yeah, that arena is going to be insane. You know, college fans might be the wildest fans ever. Like, they get active in there. So, you're definitely going to have fun. I'm rooting for Kentucky. Got to rock with Rob because he was from OCE. But I guess we'll see what happens. All right. So, we have a lot of stuff to talk about. The first thing I wanted to speak on a little bit is something that we mentioned last week about Caitlin Clark and how she did break the – all-time NCAA women's scoring record. She's quickly approaching the men's scoring record. And so we talked a little bit about how people have been comparing her to Pistol Pete of LSU. And so I just got a little more facts this time that I want your opinion on. So Pete Maravich, he is the all-time, all NCAA men or women's, their top leading scorer. So the difference is that back then he did not have the benefit of the three-point line. So the three-point line didn't come around until 1987. So Caitlin Clark, she's used the three-point to get 1,461 of her 3,569 career points. So about a third of what she has is based off the three-point line. Do you think that that in any way kind of takes away from her when she does reach the scoring record? That's part one of my question. Um, not necessarily. I mean, it's just it's a different time. Like you can't penalize somebody because it's a three point line. Like it's it's just life. Like the three point line is there now. Yeah, it's it's like everyone knows this. It's a known fact, but it's like it's not like oh, oh what she supposed to not shoot threes because it's a three point line. Like it's not really yeah. nothing like that. So I mean, it's just that's how life is going to go. Like, like in the NBA, for instance, I feel like Luka Doncic is going to have the best stats ever, mm -hmm. like in the history of the NBA, just because he came in the league at 17 years old. He doesn't jump off the ground. He shoots threes. He rebounds. He's assists. Like he fills the stat sheet. So, and he's going to play for so long since he came in at 17 and he doesn't, he's not going to really get hurt and his game will be able to uh, be, as he gets older, he's going to be able to still play basketball because of how he plays. He doesn't jump. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like the same thing uh, with the Caitlin Clark thing. Like, as as the years and as time progresses, it might be a four-point line 10 years from now. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like you can't penalize just for the game evolving. Mm -hmm. The game definitely has evolved. Now there is a three-point line. But also another difference between now and back then is that Pistol Pete, he was not eligible by NCAA rules to play as a freshman. So when he was on LSU's freshman team, he scored 741 points of his 3,667 total. That did not count. So he has over 700 points that they're not allowing to be in that total. But for Caitlin Clark, obviously she has played as a freshman and so for him, he would have played 83 games in his LSU career. Caitlin would have played 130 games. Mm. So that's a huge difference. Do you think that in any way, shape, or form impacts how people are going to view the record since she played way more? And his points didn't count. Maya, I don't think no one's going to even care about Pistol Peace's record. Like, I, you know what I'm saying? Like, to be totally honest, like I feel like, no one's gonna be like, oh, Pistol Pete. I don't think that's not even gonna be a case. Like, hmm, that's just, I, I've seen it all over my Twitter mm -hmm. for the past few weeks, but maybe that's because I'm heavily in the WBB world. But there are a lot of men who try to discredit Caitlyn by saying, 
Well, it doesn't count because there was no three-point line. Seven of his points didn't count. He played in way less games. So yeah. I've seen people to where it did matter to them. But you're saying oh, it should not matter. Yeah, my opinion is it's two different worlds. It doesn't even matter. Like, it, it doesn't matter. It's like you, you're comparing an apple to an orange. I mean, yeah, that's both fruits, but it's like it doesn't matter. Like, it's not a green apple and a red apple. You know, it's like it, it just doesn't matter. Okay. Well, shout out to Caitlin. Good luck as you do hopefully break his record. And I genuinely hope that there's no asterisk and that people just let her have this record. And it'll probably be broken again. We might not see it for, what, 10? About three, three years. I knew you were going to say that. Three I'm years. Waiting, because I just know you think Juju's going to break it, don't you? Juju's the best women's basketball player to ever touch a basketball. I'm standing on that. I'll say that probably for a long time. I don't think no one's going to be better than Juju for a long time. That girl has game. So to your defense, right, she has scored more points as a freshman than Caitlin Clark did. However, I think that's such a heavy statement to say based off of she hasn't finished a full season yet. I think that's a lot to say just this early in her collegiate career. There's so many other greats when you have the Maya Moore and the Diana Taurasi and the Candace Parkers, but you say she just got that it, it factor. No, it's it's like if you just watch it, like all you got to do is literally open your eyes and watch every single game that Juju plays and just like the size, the IQ, the athleticism, the shooting ability, the mm -hmm. charisma, like she is going to be really the best woman to ever touch a basketball. And I truly believe that because, like, I, I I can't wait for her to match up with Caitlin Clark. She's going to destroy Caitlin Clark. Like, she's going to make Caitlin Clark look really, really bad. Like, like that's not nothing – that's not going to look good at all. She's going to score at will, do whatever she wants, and she plays better defense than Caitlin Clark. Like, Juju yeah. the truth. Juju the truth. That girl the truth. Okay. Well, we'll continue to watch Juju, obviously. Y'all know over here on She Got Next, we're obsessed with Juju. We always talk about Juju. Okay, so moving on. Brittany Griner's jersey got retired. She's the seventh player in Baylor history to get their jersey retired. Now, BG, she's a three-time All-American, two-time National Player of the Year, one-time National Champ, and Final Four Most Outstanding Player. And she also has their all-time career blocks. So she's just super stat heavy over there at Baylor. She led Baylor to a 40-0 title winning season in 2012. That was the first time a team had ever gone 40 games in NCAA history without losing. So she did her thing out there. She had over 7,000 fans in the building. And so one stat that caught my attention when they were celebrating BG is that no player in women's basketball history has dunked as many times as Brittany Garner. Throughout her Baylor career, she had 18 dunks. So I ask you, who do you think we could see breaking that record? Because as soon as I saw that, I had I instantly thought of Ashlyn Watkins out of South Carolina. She's big. She can throw it down. She's still young. But 18 is a lot. It would have to be another woman that's the same size as Brittany Griner. <laughs> it's not happening if, if it's not a woman that's her size. Like. It had to be, yeah. It's, I, I, yeah, like you, I can't. That I don't think that human being is alive yet, or hasn't developed into. To I can't tell you who's going to break it because I don't. I'm not sure if that person is even alive yet. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so we think she might hold that record for a minute. Yeah, I mean, maybe maybe Brittany Griner's daughter would probably break that record or something. <laughs> <laughs> Insane if that happened. Yeah. No, it is probably happening. Like yeah. Okay. So moving on, Sue Bird was on a sports media podcast. And so she was asked about Caitlin Clark. She said that she thinks Caitlin can be a WNBA All Star in her very first year. So obviously that clip went everywhere. But Sue said, quote, I think if she plays up to her potential, yes, that's realistic. And by the way, that's not a knock on anyone in the WNBA. It's going to be hard, but I think she can do it. 
you do have to see what happens when they get there. You're now playing against adults and this is their career. But I do think she has a chance at having a lot of success early. A lot of it comes down to her long distance shooting. That is her separator. You're not really used to guarding people out there. Players in the WNBA just aren't used to guarding shooters that shoot that far. So I think it's interesting that a lot of these pros, GOATs, legends, both Sue and Cheryl Swoops, are talking about Caitlin Clark. It's good that this sort of dialogue is happening. But I do think it's a little bit too premature to be able to guess that she would be an all-star. That's kind of a lot. But in the WNBA, I do think it's easier to be an all-star in the W than in the NBA. Yeah, your first year, for sure. Yeah. For yeah. Sure. I, yeah. I do think it's easier. Um, but it I just feel like the transition from college to WNBA, it's really hard to genuinely know what's going to happen. There have been a lot of players where we're like, yeah, she's going to go and she's going to dominate. And then there's not enough roster spots and that person isn't even in the league. Or they do get in the league, but then there's a vet who's been playing for so many years who takes up all the minutes. And we don't really get to see that player shine. So I'm not sure. I would love to see Caitlin Clark as an all-star in her first year. But what do you think? Um, I like what Sue said. I feel like what some what Sue said has some truth to it. The fact that she can shoot from so far uh, is a separator because it's like when you really think about the W, it's pretty much Sabrina is the girl that shoots from that far. Maybe Jewel Lloyd and and Enrique. Uh, and Enrique yeah, I mean Enrique, uh, she she shoots a lot of bad shots, <laughs> uh, but uh, <laughs> but yeah though. So like it's literally Sabrina really that shoots it pretty efficiently. Uh, it's like the gives you the Steph Curry effect in the women's game. And mm -hmm. I feel like Kaylin will bring that to the game. It will be able to space the floor. Um, mm -hmm. So I could see that being like, yeah, she could make the all-star team. And the fact that she's going to a team that I feel suits her well. Well, she's probably going to go to a team that's going to suit her well in the fever because mm -hmm. uh, they have the bigs. And it's going to force a lot. Aaliyah Boston and Niaza Smith are going to force double teams. Like, you have to double team those women down low. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you're going to have Caitlin Clark not even being the first option, I can see her really succeeding. Uh, and, yeah, she has a chance to be that because I do think the Fever will be a good team this year as well if they get Caitlin Clark. Um, That's yeah. going to be amazing just looking at both their front court and their back court to add in both of those young players on each side. It's yeah. gonna be tough. Yeah, I th I think they're I think they're gonna be a playoff team this year. Mm -hmm. Um, if if they do get Kayla, I think it'll be a seamless fit just because that's what the Fever need. Uh, and yeah, I could see her really helping that team. And the fact that they're gonna be winning, I, I can see her being an also. I, I mean, I'm, that I, that's not far fetched at all. I don't think yeah. I feel like because shooting is something, shooting and defense is something that's gonna automatically carry over. Like, it's not going to be like a – I don't feel like it's going to be a real transition period. It might be a transition period. It's not that much defense to carry over, though. No, no, that's what I'm saying. Shooting – I'm not talking about for Kaylin Clark. I'm talking about in general. Shooting and defense are two attributes that carry over to the next level automatically. Like, you, just because you're playing against older girls or stronger girls or whatever, you're not. that doesn't mean you can't shoot now. You know what I'm saying? Defense, if you're an elite defender in college, you're going to still be an de elite defender when you go to the WNBA. That's what I mean by, like, it carries over. Uh, so, Kaylin will be able to shoot still. She's not going to just forget how to shoot because she's playing in the WNBA. Um, so, and she's going to be open. So, I, I do feel like that she can succeed in her first year. So, Sue also said, she said, if I'm Kaylin Clark, I'm coming out of college. I would not say I would go. And that's basically what you said. This is a very nice setup for her to go straight in there, adjust, and get some time to shine. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And and like and like and like like I was just saying, like literally, I feel like the fever situation. There is no better situation to get drafted to, mm -hmm. being a shooter. Like, cause I shot the ball. I would love to go play with two big girls that demand double teams and set screens. And you got a, okay, you have a pretty good point guard as well. So, like, you have a, a good veteran guard as well. So, it's like, wow, I could play off the ball. So, mm -hmm. Yeah.
our last trending topic we're going to talk about is UConn. So Paige Beckers and Aubrey Griffin both announced that they are staying another year, which we kind of knew, but I guess we can't say that we knew, knew, but we knew that they were going to end up staying. So Paige and Aubrey are staying, which is amazing. Now we get to see them take another shot at a natty or at a great season. Um, but I think it's going to be interesting since they are in their rebuild period. I wonder how long that's going to take. Like, do you think that once next season starts, they might hit the ground running and be able to do what we thought they were going to do this year? Mm. It's tough to say. Yeah, and it depends on the transfers, the new freshmen that they bring in. If exactly. people do end up healthy, it's a lot of factors. Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, that's, that's, you just took the words out of my mouth. So, <laughs> but, I am excited to see both Paige and Aubrey playing another year because they're exciting players to watch. And it it's not as fun when the team isn't healthy. Yeah. And I will say this. I do feel like that that team will be good because Geno's a good coach. Mm -hmm. and did you see he's now the second winningest coach in D1 basketball history? So okay. it's not – as exciting since Tara broke the overall record, the Stanford coach. So she's the most winningest coach. But now Gino's number two. And him and her are both still coaching. So he might catch up to her. Upset alert, right? We may as well since since we're talking about Stanford. <laughs> oh. We yeah. might as well. Yeah. <laughs> she got Gino got a little bit of help of catching her uh yesterday. Uh Arizona <laughs> upset Stanford 68-61. And the certified bucket getter, Jada Williams, ended up with 23 points, four rebounds, two assists, and two steals, leading Arizona to that win. It's a huge upset because it was actually at Stanford. And Arizona's actually seventh in the Pac-12. Stanford's number one in the Pac-12. Uh, the reason why they actually won the game was literally just, like, wow. They just played good basketball. I mean, like, they mm -hmm. made Stanford shoot under 50%. Stanford usually doesn't shoot under 50% at home. And Stanford turned the ball over 17 times. I mean, they turned that team over. They played really good defense. And 17 turnovers to eight turnovers, it's going to be tough for you to win a game because that, in turn, with all those turnovers, Arizona got up 61 shots compared to Stanford's 47 shots. So, wow. yeah, that was the, the side effect in that game, just not taking care of the ball. They're going to probably be running some suicides in practice. The biggest – I guess craziest part about what you said, obviously no one expected Stanford a number three seed to lose Arizona, but also Arizona only had seven players. Oh yeah. We forgot about, about that. Arizona before and how they I didn't have about that. Players. They had open tryouts trying to get new players yeah. on their team. They only had seven players and they yeah. were to be a powerhouse program like Stanford. Wow. Forgot about that part. Yeah. That is crazy. Actually insane. Yeah. That's insane. I wonder what the spread was for that. Let's see. Can I figure it out? Somebody paid some money for sure. I don't know what that spread was. It had to have been double digits. I don't know. I don't think anybody would have bet that. But whoever, whatever random person did, made a lot of money for sure. For sure. So shout out to Arizona. I love when teams are able to pull off a big upset. I do like the Stanford program, though, so it's not good that they lost. But – I think that's good that Arizona was able to get that moment since they have been struggling. I think last week we said they were 12 and 12, was it? Like they just, they haven't been having that good of a season. And so now they got a little, little shine on them. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's, yeah, that's really cool. Seven. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> I'm happy for them. All right. So let's go into our athlete of the week. I'm going to go first since Dallas, I feel like, we, we almost already know your athlete of the week, but I'm going to go first. So my athlete of the week, her name is Lauren Taylor, and she is a D2 basketball player out of Francis Marion. Lauren just had an insane game, and it was actually the same night that Caitlin Clark broke the all-time scoring record. So I feel like she didn't get as much shine as she should have, so we're going to give her some shine over here. Lauren set the NCAA record for any division, D1, D2, D3, all across the board, 
for a single rebound in a game. She had 44 rebounds. Golly. Yeah. Nuts. And she's only 5'11". Whoa, was she playing a bunch of, a bunch of uh, <laughs> small people? <laughs> she, she was just – she was in the zone on her Brittany Griner, Kevin Durant vibe. So, yes, five foot eleven, Lauren Taylor, she had 44 rebounds. The previous record hadn't been – the previous record was set in 1983. And so she said that she didn't even know after the game that she had broke the record. Usually during halftime, she said her coach will go through the different player stats. But that game, she was like, don't even worry about it, Lauren. Like, just keep killing it. She had no idea. But I think after the first half, she already had 25 rebounds. So she was wow. already killing it. And coach was just like, don't worry about it. Just go out there. Keep doing what you got to do. And she ended up making history. She had 30 defensive rebounds and 14 offensive rebounds, mm. which is wow. nuts. So, yeah, it is. What I think made this even crazier, though, is that Lauren's not the first Francis Marion player to break an NCAA record. This was a long time ago, from 1975 to 1979. But Pearl Moore, throughout her collegiate career, she scored 4,061 career points. That's more than... Caitlin, then Pistol Pete, that's more than anyone at any NCAA level. Mm -hmm. I'm not really sure why people don't mention her or talk about that enough as we're discussing all of these records being broken. So I just thought it was pretty cool that the same day Caitlin broke her record, another player from Francis Marion broke, I guess, a second record for their sport. I, the reason why I feel like people don't talk about it is the reason why we have this podcast. Women's sports is not shined upon enough, and that's, that's right. what we're here for. <laughs> All right, who's your athlete of the week, Dallas? Juju, Juju wrote that beat. Juju <laughs> wrote that beat. No, Juju Watkins. Uh, she took down two ranked schools this week. She took down Oregon State at Oregon State, fifty-eight to fifty. Uh, she she just controls the game in so many different ways. She controlled the game with her defense this game. Yes, yeah, she shot a lot of shots and didn't make a lot of shots in this game, but she had 11 rebounds and she literally just played defense and got the team to the win. That's the beauty of Juju's game that she doesn't even have to play that well for the impact the game and make sure the team wins. She just had that winning spirit. And then they also beat Colorado. Uh, she had 42 against Colorado, four rebounds, four assists, four steals. So, you know, She's going to break all the records, basically. Um, she's amazing. 18 to 18 from the free throw line. She doesn't miss free throws. And she's just amazing. <laughs> and I wouldn't be surprised if they won it all. Like, backdoor. USC? Backdoor win it all. Mm -hmm. Because I literally feel like she's that good that she can take down some of those teams by herself. South Carolina, of course, going to be tough. You know what I'm saying? But mm -hmm. you got to remember... It's any, it's just one game. It's not a series. Mm -hmm. So she can outplay those girls by herself in any given game. So you said you think Juju's going to break all the records. She just broke another record yesterday. So she passed Cheryl Miller for the most 30 point games in a season at USC in yeah. USC history. So yeah. every time she has a game, there's something that she's breaking, literally. I feel like that's one way you can tell that someone is a really mature basketball player because Juju is a scorer. We talk often about how high she's scoring. She's having all these 30-point games. But for her to be cognizant of, okay, I'm not really having that good of a scoring night, let me still try to get these boards. Let me try to get these assists. Let me still try to make a way for my team to ensure that we win a game. It's not about me and my numbers. It's to make sure that the overall team is able to win. That's yeah. how you can tell someone is a good player. All right, Dallas, we're running down on time because I do know that you have to go to a fancy game today. So do you want to let us know what is your free pick? Uh, my free pick for today is going to be Mississippi State against LSU. LSU is coming off a very, very, very exciting mm -hmm. upset. Not even an upset. I mean, it was upset, but... Just a shocking win against Kentucky. Uh, I feel like they're overvalued right now. It's a 
almost a pick em game. I feel like it's a big letdown spot for them versus Mississippi State. I feel like Mississippi State would be able to win the game. I also like the under in the game. So you can play it either way. LSU team total under. Uh, the game under 145, or just take Mississippi State on the money line. I think all three of those are solid bets. And, yeah, I, I like Mississippi State today. So that's my free play. All right. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Dallas, have fun at the game, and we will see you guys next week. All right. Let's do it.